Therefore, it is time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Acting Premier. The Seniors Advocacy Group, CARP, has said that the government's changes to the seniors' drug benefit will I quote, have a significant negative impact on many seniors. Because of that, I have a simple yes or no question. Mr. Speaker, will the government reverse their plan to nearly double the deductible on seniors paying for their medications? Yes or no? Deputy Premier. Oh, well, thank you, Speaker, and, and good morning. You know, when it comes to supporting seniors, this budget has a tremendous oh, yeah. number of initiatives. I know the Minister of Health is going to want to the specific issue that the, uh, that the Leader of the Opposition has raised, but let's just take a look at some of the things that we are doing to support um, I gave it a short moment to see if it could take care of itself. Carry on, please. Uh, an additional $250 million to expand capacity in home and community care, Speaker. $75 million over three years to expand palliative care, community-based hospice and palliative care. We're Member for Dufferin Caledon. To the low-income seniors benefit to 170,000 more seniors. We're making the shingles vaccine free, Speaker. We're removing the debt retirement charge. That saves seniors on average $70 a year. There are many more. I look forward to the supplement. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the acting premier. I appreciate her talking points on this file. But the reality is, on Monday, the leader of the third party raised a valid concern about how this affects seniors, and you brushed it aside. You didn't give it a real answer. The government from simply Glengarry used Prescott more Russell. smoke and mirrors approach to hide the fact that seniors and the care they need and the medications they need are being diminished. Now the Liberals actually admitted Minister maybe Tourism, they Culture didn't and get it right. And that change is now out for consultation. Well, it shouldn't have needed any more consultation. The Liberals ignored the entire pre-budget hearings, the entire process, and they didn't use common sense. So, Mr. Speaker, my question is, how out of touch is this government, how out of touch is this Liberal Party that they thought a senior making $19,000, $19,500 was rich? This government is clueless. Be seated, please. Start the clock. <laughs> Deputy Premier. The Minister of Health. Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, it, it's. Um, let me, let me go to other aspects of the CARP response to our budget, Mr. Speaker, because the Leader of the Official Opposition focused on one comment, and we welcome the comments from the CARP, but they also welcomed the Ontario government's recognition of the special needs of those with dementia, Mr. Speaker, yes. and they congratulated us for those investments and other neurological conditions by investing $10 million in behavioural supports Ontario. Yeah. CARP also welcomes that the shingles vaccine will now be covered for seniors between the ages of 65 and 70, saving them approximately $170. But I find it rich coming from the leader of the official opposition, who for nine years was part of a government, yeah. Mr. Speaker, that he never stood up for Ontario, Answer. that they decreased the Canada Health Transfer to Ontario, and he never represented the Thank needs you. of the people of this province. Thank you. Order. Uh, next one. Next one will get my attention. The member from Simcoe Gray. The member from Prince Edward Hastings. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the acting premier. Seniors already have a tough time in this province because of what this government has done. 
This government has cut residency spots when 800,000 Ontarians can't find a family doctor. Seniors and seniors can't find their family physician. Now seniors are having a tougher time Minister of Natural Resources. This comes because the government cut $50 million from seniors' physiotherapy. One in ten seniors already don't fill their prescriptions because of the cost that prohibits it. And now the government has just made medication twice as expensive for so many seniors. So my question, Mr. Speaker, is when will this government stop their attack on Ontario seniors? Well, Mr. Speaker, yeah, I don't think uh, anybody's buying that argument, Mr. Speaker. That the, re the reality is, 170,000 more low-income seniors will pay no annual deductible. They'll go from paying $100 annually deductible to zero dollars. 170,000 for a total of almost 500,000. And Ontarians are see are see. Stop the clock. Uh, I'm not going to be bouncing up and down. The last two rounds were not acceptable, and I'm going to say now that uh, I've been tempted, and I'll leave this for you to decide, do we move to right to warnings or naming? It's got to stop. I want to hear everybody when they're standing. Minister. Mr. Speaker, seniors in Ontario will continue to have the most generous and the lowest out-of-pocket expenses yep. for prescription drugs in all of Canada. <laughs> On average, Answer. the out-of-pocket is $277 for Ontarians. The, the member for Bruce Gray Owen Sound is more than $600 per senior, yeah. per senior for their out-of-pocket expenses. Thank you. Expenses, Mr. Speaker. Good question. The leader of the opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the acting premier. Since I can't get a straight answer on cuts to medications for seniors, let's try something else. Ontario's budget is still missing a credible plan to have affordable and competitive energy. The PC caucus had a simple ask. We wanted a plan to have affordable energy the from in Trinity the province of Ontario. The Liberal response was to offer $2 a month as a rebate. This does nothing for a senior who has an $800 hydro bill. Mr. Speaker, is this government, is this Liberal Party embarrassed that their idea of energy relief is giving a toonie to Ontarians that are flooded in your cost because you've made a mess of the energy sector? Yeah. Yeah. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Speaker, and of course, we on this side are anxiously awaiting their plan to reduce energy costs. Speaker, that seems to have been missing in action. You know, Speaker, the the the, the leader of the opposition uh, referred. All right, we're moving to warnings, and I'll give them out. Carry on. Uh, speaker, the leader of the opposition uh, called us clueless. Well, do you think it's clueless to offer free tuition to kids in low-income families and reduce tuition costs for middle-income families? Do you think that's clueless? Do you think it's clueless to, build, to spend $160 billion on infrastructure? That's 110,000 jobs a year. Do you think that's clueless? Do you Chair, think please. it's clueless to add a bill? I would not take that chance. To the chair, please. Finish. Uh, speaker, do they think it's clueless to lower parking fees for 900,000 patients in visit? Answer. Do they think it's clueless to fund the shingles vaccine? Do they think it's clueless to invest $100 million to Thank help you. homeowners lower their. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Acting Premier. My question was on energy. I'd appreciate an answer on energy. Not only did this budget do nothing to make energy more affordable, this budget did nothing to rein in the executive salaries at Hydro One that are completely out of touch with the rest of Canada. After this budget, the combined salaries of six Hydro executives in four other provinces is still less than the $4 million gold-plated paycheck you gave the CEO of Hydro One. After this budget, the CEO will still make twice as much as the three highest-paid executives in the British Columbia. Columbia Hydro. So, Mr. Speaker, why didn't this budget rein in the lavish paychecks for your Hydro One execs? 
Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Speaker, the question is premised on, on electricity prices and the level of electricity prices, Mr. Speaker. And some of the examples that have been used of large numbers of uh, monthly payments uh, are, are true bills, Mr. Speaker, and they're typically in the rural and northern uh, communities, Mr. Speaker. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, in our budget, uh, access to natural gas infrastructure we, we acknowledge is crucial to the long-term economic fortunes of rural and northern Ontario. And to mitigate prices, Mr. Speaker, we've got a plan to take natural gas into rural and northern communities. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, the budget has $200 million loan program. Uh, to expand natural gas. Uh, it uh, proposes a $30 million natural gas economic development grant, Mr. Speaker, for, for uh, rural communities. And Mr. Speaker, Union Answer. Gas at the present time has 11 applications before the Ontario Energy Board to bring natural gas to rural communities. Thank you. The member from Prince Edward Hastings is warned. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier, uh, back to the Acting Premier and the Minister of Energy. What in the world does that have to do with the Hydro One salaries? You know, I just appreciate an answer for once in this building. It would be nice. It would be kind if the government could respond with an answer. There is no plan for affordable energy. There is no plan to rein in Hydro One CEO salaries. There is no plan to stop the fire sale of Hydro One. This budget does nothing to recoup. Minister of Finance is warned. Carry on. This budget does nothing to recoup the billions of dollars you're giving away to our competitors because of your contracts. The, the, you're actually giving to our competitors. The Premier says, what is the cost of doing nothing? Well, the cost of doing nothing is that families are paying $1,000 more a year because of your government. So my, my question is, will you do something? Will you actually do something on the energy sector? Ontario can't afford these exorbitant... You see it, please. Thank you, Minister of Energy. Indicated in this house uh, over the last week or two that the average daily price for electricity in Ontario. I'm only going to give you what you want. The member from Simcoe Gray is warned. Carry on. The average residential price in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, is five five dollars. The average daily price is five dollars, Mr. Speaker, uh, and we have taken uh, additional steps, Mr. Speaker, for the rural communities, Mr. Speaker, uh, and uh, the rural and remote electricity rate protection program is a rate equalization program that benefits rural and remote residential and farm customers, uh, since the cost of distributing power to remote areas is much higher than in the urban areas. The program helps to offset higher costs of providing service to customers in those areas. And Hydro One has also launched, Mr. Speaker, a conservation program of heat pumps, which and they, they subsidize the cost, which will Answer. lower costs in rural areas, Mr. Speaker, by eight hundred to fifteen hundred dollars a year, Mr. Speaker. We're taking action, we're acknowledging the Thank challenge you. in the rural and remote areas, and we're taking your question, Mr. Malton. Thank you very much. My question is to the Deputy Premier. Telling a senior living on $19,500 a day that the cost of their medication is going to double overnight is wrong. Now the Premier says she's open to changing her plan to nearly double prescription costs for most seniors, and being open is a good thing. And act, but make, being open to a change and actually making that change are very different things. So let's be clear. Will the Liberal government commit to changing their plan today? Thank you, Deputy Premier. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you, well, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the Premier has been clear that we will be sure to get this right for all seniors. We're bringing 170,000 of the lowest income seniors into a situation where they go from $100 deductible each year to $0 deductible. That's, I, think, I hope that that's something, even though they haven't referenced or mentioned that, that's something even the new NDP can support. But Mr. Speaker, we need to look at, and so the, the Premier was also absolutely clear that as we put this forward for discussion and consultation, there will be regulations required that will be sure to get it right. And if changes need to be made, we'll make those changes. But Mr. Speaker, it's important, and I plead for the third party to at least acknowledge the added value, the important impact that this is going to have for Answer. the poorest of the poor that they used to care about, Mr. Speaker, the 170,000 new individuals that Thank will you. be almost half a million seniors that pay. Thank you. 
Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the seniors of this province are pleading with this government not to increase their drug costs. You don't need a panel of experts to tell you that forcing seniors living on $19,500 to pay nearly twice as much for their medication is a wrong decision. The Premier says she agrees, but she needs a consultation. Does the, go does the Liberal government really need a consultation to tell them that it's not fair to make struggling seniors pay even more for their medication? Thank you. Mr. Hill. Well, let's look at some of the comparisons across the country and what this province has done for our seniors when it comes to out-of-pocket drug costs. In Ontario, it's 277. That's the average cost to a senior for the out-of-pocket prescription drug costs, apart from what the government provides for them, Mr. Speaker. If we go to the province uh, furthest west in British Columbia, it's $615. It is the average annual out-of-pocket cost for our seniors. Alberta is $613. Mr. Speaker, an NDP government. Saskatchewan is $884, the annual out-of-pocket expenses. Manitoba is $982, Mr. Speaker. Quebec is $698. Here in Ontario, the average out-of-pocket cost for a senior. The member from Timmins, James Bay, is warned. You have a uh, 10-second wrap-up. So, Mr. Speaker, we have the most generous prescription drug program in the entire country for seniors. There's no other Thank province you. that comes even close. The next province. Thank you. Stop, stop. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Final supplementary. Thank you. Come on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thursday's budget gave Ontario seniors a shock. For most of them, their drug, drug costs are going to nearly double this summer. For seniors living on a fixed income, this creates chaos. For a struggling senior, these costs could mean the difference between paying for rent or paying for their heating bill. Now the Premier says she's consulting and that she's open to changes, but she won't say for sure if she's actually willing to make those changes at the end of the day. And these are still costs that are going to seriously affect seniors. Will the Liberal government be clear today that they're fixing the Premier's mistakes and tell Ontarians that they'll see a new plan that will not attack seniors? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, I uh, am surprised because uh, in one moment the member of the third party said that we need to consult more. And now he's suggesting that we not consult with seniors, that we not consult with their advocacy groups, that we not consult with Ontarians to look to make sure that we've got this absolutely right, that it works for all seniors. And Mr. Speaker, I think that most seniors would agree that bringing 170,000 of the lowest income speakers, uh, seniors into that range where they pay absolutely no annual deductible is a good thing. We want to make sure that we've got it right for all seniors. And frankly, I think that the old NDP would have supported this. The new NDP, unfortunately, they don't want consultation. Answer. They don't appreciate the 170,000 that no longer have to pay any annual deductible. Thank you. The uh, new question, the member from Bradley Vermont. Thank you very much. The next question again is to the Deputy Premier. The Premier's plan to double the cost of medication for seniors was a mistake, and it's a good thing that the Premier acknowledges that that was a mistake and is working towards correcting it. But we're hearing the government is also quietly making some changes to the tuition plan, saying it was their plan all along to tie grants to increasing, increasing tuitions as well as to inflation. But what other mistakes does the Liberal government see in their budget, and which of these mistakes will they be correcting? You know, uh, Speaker, I look up at the gallery, I look at the kids who join us in the legislature every day, and we have an important message for those kids now that we co could not give those kids before this budget. And the message we can give kids now is your job is to work hard, get the marks, get admitted into post secondary education. You no longer need to worry about the financial barriers. My, uh my operation, in terms of this chair, applies to everybody. Finish, please. 
This change is absolutely transformational, Speaker. It tears down a barrier that kids in low-income families, kids in moderate-income families have faced since the beginning of post-secondary education, and that is the financial Answer. barrier. Kids now can succeed based on their willingness to work hard, Speaker, and we will make sure that money will never, ever stand in the way of students right. achieving their full potential. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Selling Hydro One is also a mistake. Everyone knows it. Given the Premier says that she may fix her mistake on the seniors' drug costs, will the Liberal government commit to correcting this mistake and not sell off our public asset? You know, Speaker, the, um, the, the old NDP would have been applauding this budget, Speaker. This budget contains investments that the old NDP would have been standing up and saying, well done. This reflects our values, whether it's more investments in hospice and palliative care, whether it's removing the financial barrier for post-secondary education, Speaker, whether it's investing in, uh, in hospices and uh, a member from Windsor Tecumseh is warned. Carry on. We're proud of this budget, Speaker. We think we've made the right investments that will improve the lives of people in this province. It's a, it's a budget that creates jobs, Speaker. It's a budget that demonstrates strong fiscal management. We've, we've worked hard to arrive at this, Answer. Speaker, and overwhelmingly, people are saying, you're making changes we never thought you'd be able to make. Speaker, the NDP should get on board with us and support this budget. Thank you. Final supplementary. I know some of the Liberals in this House, some of the old Liberals in this House, remember when they spoke against the privatization of Hydro One. So, an interesting point here is. Let me tell you why, Mr. Speaker, this budget is so horrible and why the NDP proudly will vote against it. It's a mistake to slash $430 million from education. It's a mistake to slash $50 million from post-secondary and training. It's a mistake to slash $1.2 billion from about everything else. It's a mistake not to cap tuition fees. This budget is a colossal mistake. Will the Liberal government admit that their budget is full of mistakes and commit to addressing those mistakes today? Thank you. Speaker, this, this uh, uh, budget makes some really important investments that are no mistakes at all. Are you saying it's a mistake to increase funding Chair, for autism uh, by $355 million, Speaker? Are you saying it's a mistake? To, to build 20 more hospices and support that community care? Are you saying it's a mistake? Um, I'm sorry. Third person. To the chair. Thank you. It's astonishing to me that they think it's a mistake to remove the financial barrier to post-education. You would think, Speaker, that that would have been a core value of the NDP. On that item alone, they should be applauding this budget, Speaker, and it's very disappointed yes, that they have sunk into the partisanship to attack this budget that is a superb budget. Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. A new question, the member from Perth, Wellington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the uh, Minister of Community and Social Services of this old Liberal government. <laughs> the, the bankruptcy of Goodwill Toronto is leaving hundreds out of work. Many wonder if they will ever see the severance pay owed to them. Yet last year, the government doled out $4 million to Goodwill, including nearly $1.7 million from MCSS. What do they have to show for it besides the $230,000 CEO salary? That money, like the millions and millions blown in the Sam's fiasco, is gone. Gone with zero accountability and no consequences. My question is this. Does it surprise the minister to know that as far as taxpayers are concerned, the Liberals have abused all of their goodwill? 
Minister of Community and Social Services. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And of course, we on this side of the House take employment supports for those with disabilities extremely seriously. And so, of course, we were shocked when uh, we all read about what happened at Goodwill Toronto. And I'd like to tell the member opposite that since then we have reached out to every one of our clients served by Goodwill and to determine how best to support each individual and minimize disruption. And so we have now made sure that many of these individuals have new employment supports because, of course, our ministry provided funding to Goodwill to support individuals with a disability, including developmental disabilities, to find employment in their community Answer. locally. And I will, in the supplementary, give a little bit more detail in terms of our funding arrangement. Thank you. Yes. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker. I hope this minister is listening to people who tell her what is really going on. Media quoted Goodwill insiders who say MCSS funding was improperly diverted, leaving disabled clients without proper staff or resources. Executives, according to the Toronto Sun report, expensed things like car washes with no apparent checks and balances, and staff didn't get the training they needed. The minister needs to tell us why she rewarded such dysfunction with millions of dollars. Why, did the minister hold the, why didn't the minister hold the CEO accountable? Why did the minister treat the CEO with the same kid gloves they used with Chris Mazza at Orange? Thank you. Yes, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And of course, Goodwill's funding was provided on a monthly basis. As soon as the ministry became aware of the program closure, all payments were stopped. And we will be working through the bankruptcy process to recover any funds owed to the ministry. Of course, our focus on this time is to helping our clients transition. I can assure the member opposite that any unused funds will be returned throughout this process. Our ministry does ensure that the agency is always in compliance. We look very closely at the 2014-2015 commitments, and we dis uh, discovered at that time through a very uh, detailed process through our transfer payment uh, process that the agency was in compliance. And I want to assure the member that we will be diligent in recovering any unused funds. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your question, the member from Kitchener Waterloo. As speaker, my question is to the Minister of Finance. Last week, the government introduced its 2016 budget, Fewer Jobs for Today and Tomorrow. That's a fair statement. The government has admitted in black and white that job projections are down by 60,000. And according to the Financial Accountability Officer, Ontario's total employment for 2015 matched the weakest annual job gain since the recession. Minister, this question is for the Ontarians that have left the job market discouraged, for the Ontarians that are struggling to find work, and, and for the Ontarians that are about to be begin their careers. Where is this government's job creation strategy? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Speaker, I'm going to allow my colleague to do the supplementary. Let's be clear, Ontario and Ontarians, the people of Ontario, the business of Ontario, because of the work we've done to stimulate economic growth and partner with business have created over 608,000 net new jobs since that recession. Furthermore, Mr. Speaker, we're aiming to have 320,000 more new jobs over the next 36 months, bringing us over 900,000 net new jobs. And in the last eight weeks, we've had 50,000 new jobs outpacing all of Canada. Our growth has outpaced the United States in percentage growth as well, Mr. Speaker. We're proud of Ontarians. We talk and support the people of Ontario, as should the NDP. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, new, do new Democrats believe that Ontarians deserve a secure job that can actually support a family, but this budget fails miserably on job creation. This budget doesn't address, for example, the fact that so many Ontarians across this province are working multiple jobs just to make ends meet. It also doesn't talk about the th fact that for nearly two years straight, Windsor has remained among the top two cities with the highest unemployment rate in the country. It has also conveniently left out the fact fact that for 144 months straight, Ontario's youth unemployment rate has beat the national number. That is not a record to be proud of. Minister, what's this government's response to the thousands of Ontarians that it has clearly left behind? Thank you. Minister, Minister of Economic Development and Infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Minister, Mr. Speaker, I mean, anybody listening to that rhetoric 
has got to wonder what the NDP is looking at when it comes to the health of our economy. They've got to wonder, Mr. Speaker, what economists they're consulting when they say that we're not gaining in jobs. The finance minister is absolutely right. 608,300 net new jobs since the global recession. That's only number one in the country. It's one of the leading jurisdictions in the industrialized world, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to job creation. And how many of those jobs are full-time? How about 100 per cent of those jobs are full-time? How many of those jobs are higher-income jobs? How about 75 per cent of those jobs being in Answer. sectors that are a higher income? Mr. Speaker, let's stick to the facts. We're creating jobs. We're creating good jobs. We're creating jobs right across this province. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Speaker. No question. The member from Durham. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Community and Social Services. As the Minister knows, Ontario's social assistance programs are critical to our, our poverty reduction goals to support the most vulnerable members of our society. Maintaining an effective social safety net is, is one part of our government's broader effort to reduce poverty and ensure that we have an inclusive society and economy. I have heard from single mothers in Bowmanville who struggle with child support and feel they need more assistance. They have told me that the system can be complex to navigate for those who need it. In last week's budget, our government announced an income security reform process. Speaker, could the minister tell me more about this min her ministry's work to reform the, the income security system? for vulnerable Ontarians. Thank you. Minister of Community and Social Services. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and to the member from Durham for that question. Part of my mandate as Minister of Community and Social Services is to reform social assistance. And over the past year, my ministry has had ongoing discussions with stakeholders, experts, and those on the front line. They told us that it's important to expand reform to include aspects of the wider income security system. We listened, and we will be engaging stakeholders in the coming year to develop an action plan for more comprehensive reform. The plan will be informed by client experiences and a basic income pilot project, among other things. We will also engage with First Nations, Inuit and Metis Nations to ensure we have had an inclusive process. And as we develop this action plan, we will continue to take important immediate steps to improve income security, Answer. such as ending the full clawback of child support from social assistance. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for sharing information about this important plan to improve our income security system for vulnerable Ontarians. It is vital that we reduce barriers to ensure that we have a fair, adequate and accessible income security system that is simpler for Ontarians who are facing challenges in their lives. Speaker, we know that some of those Ontarians facing challenges are single parents and their children who receive social assistance. Families in Curtis and Port Perry have come to my office concerned about what is available to them and what we are going to do for them. Minister, the minister just mentioned ending the clawback of child support for social assistance recipients. Could the minister please share more information with me and my constituents about this important challenge to social assistance. Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, we, <clears throat> we know that children in single parent families are disproportionately and more profoundly affected by poverty. And as part of our government's commitment to combating child poverty, as outlined in our 2016 budget, my ministry will be ending the full clawback of child support for social assistance recipients. Currently, families receiving child support have their social assistance benefit reduced by the full amount of child support they receive. This means means that families on social assistance are no better off when they receive child support and the parent responsible for making payments may feel little incentive to pay. We would like to see a full exemption of child support for social assistance recipients, but it is important that we get the opinions we need on how best to solve the problem here in Ontario. What we know is that families who receive child support will see a positive change by this time next yes, year. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Halliburton, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question
question is for the Acting Premier. In last week's budget, the only mention of human trafficking was the re-announcement of funding to address violence against Indigenous women, an effort that is long overdue. But there is no new funding for more dedicated officers to investigate human trafficking, no new funding for dedicated Crown attorneys to prosecute this disgusting crime, and no new funding for victim services within that massive $134 billion budget. This government says human trafficking is a crisis. This government says that combating this crime is a priority. This crime is stealing the innocence of our young women. Mr. Speaker, why is this government forcing the girl next door to continue to live in this nightmare? Thank you, Minister responsible for women's issues. Minister responsible for women and youth services. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the uh, member from Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes, Brock. Uh, a colleague in Durham Region with me for raising this important topic again. And, uh uh, I want to also thank her for work on the, the Select Committee on uh, Violence and Harassment Against Women. And I was very pleased that uh, she was supportive of our Walking Together strategy the Premier and I announced last week, a $100 million investment to end violence against Aboriginal women and girls. But that's only part of the story. She's absolutely right. It's only part of the story, Speaker. Human trafficking is a serious issue. It's a significant priority for our government, and that's why the Premier asked uh, the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services and I to uh, spearhead additional work in human trafficking to build on the investments we've and already sir. made and bring that uh, strategy forward this June. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, the Liberal government didn't put human trafficking uh, address it enough in their budget. They didn't put it in Bill 132. How much longer do these victims and survivors have to wait? We've learned from the experts that a trafficker can make over $250,000 in a year from one victim. That's roughly $5,000 a week from a single person. So during the time that a trafficker makes $5,000 in one week from one victim, this government has invested zero to combat How this sad. deplorable crime. The Premier admitted that driving up drug costs for seniors was a mistake. So, Mr. Speaker, will the government admit that they got this one wrong and redirect resources to combat human trafficking today? Well, well no, Speaker. Uh, we are actually continuing to invest in uh, dealing with this despicable uh, uh, topic of human trafficking. We invest over $9 million over the next three years in our language interpreter program services. We provided 225000 funding the White Ribbon Campaign to develop and promote uh, resources that engage young men in ending human trafficking. And uh, I could go on and on about a number of investments across uh, ministries beyond my Ontario Women's Directorate speaker. Uh, we fund a victim's helpline service uh, through um, I believe that is through uh, community services and uh, corrections. We have um, provided additional money to help uh, young people in shelters be aware of human trafficking conditions and to try to prevent Answer. that. We have more money for sexual violence uh, programs across the, the province, and uh, we'll continue to work with all the stakeholders in bringing forward Thank you. a more robust human trafficking well. strategy. By Thank you. A new question. The member from Algoma, Manitou. Thank you, Speaker. Good morning to you. My question is to the Acting Premier. For over eight years, we have heard this government say the Ring of Fire is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Year after year, we hear them make big promises. All have come back empty. This government, who claims to be committed to this project, continues to stand by and watch all companies leave and halt operations. My question, Mr. Speaker, is when they say once in a lifetime, whose lifetime are you talking about? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. The Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. I'm happy to respond to this question, Speaker. Speaker, our government has been laying for several years the, found, the groundwork to drive smart and sustainable and a collaborative development in the region of the Ring of Fire. We realize the full potential of the Ring of Fire, but it is an extremely complex undertaking that all parties have to be involved in. We're supporting sustainable development in the Ring of Fire. Significant progress has been made, has been made to date. 
our government has established a Ring of Fire Infrastructure Development Corporation. We've made a $1 billion commitment to develop transportation infrastructure in the region and it was recently reiterated in our budget. We have reached a historic regional framework agreement with the Matawa First Nations that lays the ground. We were doing quite well, and it's never too late to get another warning or after those that have got warnings to get named. Uh, I'm not playing, and it's not a roll of the dice. I'll do what I need to do if you don't. Finish, please. The uh, regional framework agreement lays the uh, groundwork Answer. for future discussions with the Matawa First Nations, and just this past spring, we announced a joint investment with the Thank federal you. government of more than $785,000. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, to the acting premier. Once again, we hear this government re-announce an old 2014 promise to invest $1 billion in the Ring of Fire. It's clear that this is a copy-and-paste budget. This government continues to dangle this $1 billion announcement over the heads of industry, Northerners and First Nations without actually seeing when it will give it. This project is dependent on transportation, infrastructure, electricity prices, environmental guidelines and leadership by this government, but they have failed on all accounts. My question, Mr. Speaker, is will this government give a definite answer on when they will make good on this commitment, or will they wait to re-announce it again at campaign time? Well, Speaker, as I said before, we've invested $785,000 to enable the Ring of Fire Nations to complete a community service corridor study. That's one of the first steps to establishing a transportation corridor. Just this past June, the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change approved various amendments with uh, respect to terms of reference for the environmental assessment for Noron's Eagle's Nest project in the Ring of Fire. We are serious about moving forward with the Ring of Fire. You know, the PC party has not been engaged in this issue. The former federal PC party was not engaged in this issue when Ontario put up a billion dollars, billion dollars for the for the uh, railway or road corridor. Answer. The federal government ponied up a measly 23 million dollars, and the leader of the Thank opposition you. was a member of the party. Thank you. Your question, the member from Halton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. Mr. Speaker, Ontario is home to a large, important Indigenous population, but as we all know, this vital community faces many challenges and needs our support. That's why. Look, um, this is going both sides. Uh, when somebody asks a question here, I'm hearing heckling from the same side that's asking the question, and I'm hearing heckling from the same side of the person that's asking the question and giving the answer. Please. Finish, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, that's why in our 2016 Ontario budget, our government announced significant investments in important initiatives for First Nations, Métis and Inuit people in Ontario to support these communities. In fact, the Premier also announced a bold new strategy to end violence against Aboriginal women before heading Question. to the National Roundtable on Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister please elaborate on these important announcements and their significance? Thank you. Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, this budget was a good news budget for our First Nation community. We have committed ourselves in this budget to a positive, to a collaborative relationship with Ontario First Nations. Here are some of the things that we've done in the budget. The 2016 budget invests $100 million over three years to fund a long-term strategy to end violence against Indigenous women. The budget also provides another $97 million to improve access to very high-quality post-secondary education and training opportunities. $5 million of this investment is for uh, post-secondary education and training at the, at the province's nine Aboriginal institutes. 
There's a further $13 million for First Nation green energy products uh, projects specifically aimed at eliminating yes, the evil, the evil, the evil of diesel in our northern remote communities. This is good news for the First Nations. Thank you. This is evidence of our Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm glad to hear the minister is working hard for Ontario's Indigenous peoples, and I thank him for his tireless efforts. Our government is taking significant steps to improve outcomes for Indigenous people in this province, and I'm proud to be a part of that. Mr. Speaker, last week, Minister Zimmer, Minister McCharles, and the Premier were in Winnipeg for the second National Roundtable on Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. Statistics show that in Ontario, Indigenous women are three times more likely to experience violence than other women, and they are three times more likely to be murdered. This is unacceptable. The numbers are troubling, Mr. Speaker, and they need to change. That's why the Premier recently announced our strategy to end violence against Indigenous women and mandatory Indigenous cultural competency training Question. for the Ontario Public Service. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister please tell us more about what the budget does Thank for you. Indigenous peoples? Mr. Aboriginal First. Thank you. Speaker, the budget provides that $100 million to develop a strategy against violence and uh, violence against Aboriginal women and girls. I was with the Premier and Minister McCharles in Winnipeg on uh, Thursday and Friday, at which Ontario, in front of our, our other provincial colleagues and the federal minister was there and the Premier of Manitoba. We presented the, uh, our Ontario strategy walking together. It was discussed at length at the meeting on Friday. It was incredibly well received by our provincial counterparts and the federal government. There is much detail in this document. The document is entitled, Working Together, Ontario's Long-Term Strategy to End Violence Against Women. It was very well received. The, uh, Ontario Answer. has exercised a leadership role. The Premier has exercised a leadership role, and all of the other provinces and the Thank federal you. government have recognized. Thank you. New question: The member from Stormer and Dundas and South Glengarry. I give speaker to the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. In your budget, you plan to bring a digital by default philosophy to Service Ontario and raise service fees. But the uptake in digital services by Ontarians hasn't progressed between 2012 and 2015, staying flat at 30 per cent. We know where this leads higher fees for everyone and an additional cost and inconvenience for constituents, such as seniors, disabled Ontarians, or Ontarians in fixed incomes, or those who don't have the knowledge and the confidence or the ability to operate a computer. Will the minister commit to ensuring seniors, disabled Ontarians, those in social assistance, and other Ontarians who need to visit a counter in person who will be able to access quality, courteous, timely, and helpful service without a cost penalty. Thank you. Minister of Government and uh, Community Services. Mr. Speaker, uh, thank you very much, uh, and I uh, certainly appreciate the question from the member opposite. Service Ontario is committed to the highest quality standards of service uh, for Ontarians and has been for many, many years. Uh, as you know, the average wait time is less than 15 minutes in uh, Service Ontario, uh, and the number of services that we are continuing to provide online continue to be expanded while we continue to protect uh, front counter services. We have approximately 300 locations across the province. We continue to build the platform to make it easier and more timely for people to access services. In the budget, we committed to uh, transforming the health uh, application for health cards. You'll be able to renew your health card online uh, through Service Ontario. Uh, moving forward. We think that's great news for Ontarians. We're going to continue to make services more accessible for Ontarians uh, as we continue to move forward. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you. Back to the minister. Your government is making everything more expensive. Driving, camping, fishing, hunting, heating, filling prescriptions, charities, and even dying with your new estate taxes. If it exists, you bill Ontarians for it. Your government's record is of higher prices for everything and less access to services to show for it. Why does this government insist on making life more inconvenient and more ex expensive for all Ontarians, and especially those like seniors, the disabled, and the poor, and those who can least afford it? Thank you, Minister. 
Speaker, you know the, the member is being a bit selective here in his uh, in his questioning, and I think you know when you talk about eliminating things like drive clean and free shingles vaccines and whatnot, there are a number of initiatives in the budget that are helping uh, to support uh, to support uh, consumers across the province. We continue to build a strong platform in Service Ontario for accessibility and affordability. Service Ontario delivers 88 services across 10 lines of businesses. All of the policies that uh, are developed come from other ministries as well. Service Ontario provides those services based on the policies through a variety of ministries. So the member needs to understand that the services that we continue to provide, we do so in a timely way, in an efficient way, putting more services online, making them more accessible, continuing to make Answer. it more convenient and more affordable, quite frankly, for all Ontarians to access services in our ministry. Thank you. you. No question. The member from Niagara Falls. Mr. Speaker, my question today is to the Minister of Transportation. The 2016 budget mentioned go to Niagara. And like everyone in the Niagara region, I was happy to you said it, please. You said it, please. You won't know. Thank you. Member? I was happy to see that. This, this cut. This project is extremely important for the people of my riding and all of Niagara. This was a positive step forward and highlights the hard work that the local mayors, councillors, our regional chair and the member for St. Catharines has done to put Niagara Go on the radar of our government. Um, I, think there are, uh, I think there are ways in which we can continue now. Please finish. The expansion of Go Train serves, service to Niagara is not about scoring political points. Unfortunately, without firm commitments to a timeline, the people of Niagara still cannot be sure when expanded Go service will come to Niagara Falls. Minister, does your government have a West time Jim. frame for the expanding Go ser train service all the way to Niagara Falls? Thank you. Mr. Transportation. Uh, thanks very much, Speaker. I, uh, I want to begin by thanking the member from Niagara Falls for the question. Uh, I, should, I know that he's already said it, Speaker, but I think it does bear repeating because it's important to recognize that not just over the last few months, not just over the last couple of years, but for throughout his entire career here in this chamber, the member from St. Catharines has been a consistent advocate for more for Niagara Region, and specifically, he's been a staunch champion to extend GO Train service down to Niagara Region, Speaker. And I believe that member deserves a very, a very vigorous round of applause for his continued advocacy. Speaker, the member from Niagara Falls is 100% right in mentioning that on page 71, in fact, of Ontario budget, Ontario budget 2016, we say specifically, Speaker, subject to agreement with freight rail partners, uh, we will see two-way all-day rail services on the Kitchener and Milton GO corridors and extension of GO rail service to both Niagara and yes, Bowenville, Speaker. I would acknowledge. I would, say, I would say to the member opposite that the Ministry of Transportation and Metrolinx will you. continue to work with the municipalities to deliver on the following. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For more than two years, I have talked about the importance of expanding Go to Niagara. The Premier herself called it one of her top priorities nearly two years ago. And this is important. Expansion of Go Train would have a positive economic impact of $195 million for Niagara, create 2,400 new full-time jobs in Niagara, resulting from transit operations and much-needed 1,200 additional full-time construction jobs to implement daily GO service. Without a firm timeline, the municipalities of Niagara Region that are all united behind this project cannot make plans to take full advantage of the economic benefit GO Service expansion will provide. 
Will you commit today to a timeline Person. for two-way all day go to Niagara Falls? I've already read the budget. Can you Thank commit you. to the time frame today? Thank you. Minister. Thanks very much, Speaker. I, again, I thank the member from Niagara Falls for the question. I, uh, I uh, certainly look forward to continuing to work with the member from St. Catharines, with all of the municipalities, Speaker, uh, to make sure that we go forward, that we negotiate, that we do the deal that's required in order to make this extension a reality, Speaker. That's a commitment I'm happy to give that member and every member in this legislature as it relates to all of the transportation items that are contained in Ontario Budget 2016, Speaker. I think what's Probably most important, if I could be helpful and provide some advice to my friend across the way, as he and his colleagues uh, consider on Budget 2016 in the coming days and weeks, Speaker, I sincerely hope, because I know he's a champion for Niagara Falls, that he'll encourage his leader and his caucus colleagues to support Ontario Budget 2016 so that we can deliver on its full promise Thank for sir. the people of Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. New question? The member from Burlington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Associate Minister of Finance. Minister, I was pleased to see the budget reaffirm our government's commitment to enhancing retirement security. I know that residents in my riding of Burlington are pleased to see our government taking a leadership role in this issue. In fact, together with the minister just last year, we hosted a roundtable in Burlington on the ORPP with local businesses and social planning groups. And because we are a young Liberal government, Mr. Speaker, who is investing in the future of our young people, they were there too. And why is that? Because they care about their future and they're concerned about it. People in my riding and beyond know how hard it is to save for retirement. They know the world of work is changing and they understand that a number of young workers no longer have access to a work-based pension plan. They want to know that their children and grandchildren will be able to retire with dignity and financial security. Mr. Speaker, I know the minister has made a lot of progress on the development of the plan in the past several months. Minister, can you please highlight some of the milestones that the government has achieved on the ORPP? Thank you. Associate Minister of Finance. Thank you, Speaker. And I, I want to really thank uh, the fantastic member from Burlington for her hard work on this uh, particular issue in her community. We have we have made significant progress in our commitment to build a strong and secure retirement income system for the people of Ontario. Our goal is for all Ontario employees to be part of the ORPP or a comparable plan by 2020. Our government passed the Ontario Retirement Pension Plan Act 2015 and the Ontario Retirement Plan Administrative Corporation Act 2015. These pieces of legislation lay the foundation for the ORPP and established the ORPP AC, the arm's length entity that will administer the plan for the benefit of plan members. Last fall, we appointed the initial board of directors who will be responsible for the ORPPAC, Susan Wahlberg-Jenna, who will serve as chair, Murray Gold and Richard Nesbitt, all bringing unique expertise to the ORPPAC and will work towards its implementation. We've also completed our plan design for a contemporary mobile workforce like the people who live in your community of Burlington. Mr. Speaker, we're taking important important steps forward to ensure that Ontarians can retire with dignity. We want to ensure Question. that future uh, retirees answer, sorry. have an opportunity speaker, to have a predictable stream of income for life when they retire. Yeah. Thank you so much, Speaker. Thank you, supplementary. thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for her response. My constituents will be pleased to hear about the great work underway to enhance retirement security across Ontario. They will be particularly pleased to hear about the experience and expertise of the initial board of directors. Indeed, we are truly fortunate to have such accomplished individuals overseeing the plan's administration on behalf of all Ontarians. Mr. Speaker, again through you to the Minister, I know that last year the Minister travelled across the province to get input from businesses and employees on the plan design details. I understand that earlier this year, our government finalized the plan's design. I know residents and business owners in my riding are keen to know more about these policy decisions. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please update this House on the policy decisions that our government has released? Thank you, Social Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you once again to the hardworking member for that question. Mr. Speaker, as the member from Burlington suggests, our government has made important progress on the key design features of the ORPP. Last year, I had an extensive consultation across Ontario speaking with business, labour, families, and individuals in more than 10 communities across the province. In August 
August of 2015, our government announced some of the key design details of the ORPP, including plan comparability, phasing in of contribution rates, staged implementation, and setting a minimum earnings threshold. Our plan design was confirmed last month, including but not limited to details about funding policy, survivor benefits, and the definition of Ontario employment. Moving forward, we are working with members of our recently established Business Implementation Advisory Group to exchange information and knowledge with the business community as the ORPP is implemented for January 2017 when enrollment begins. <laughs> Thank you. We question the member from Sonia Lampton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is to the acting premier. The township of Frontenac Islands opened their annual OPP policing bill this year, Mr. Speaker, to find out that it was $26,000 higher than normal. The OPP told them it was because they had to police wind turbines. Under the OPP's new billing model, municipalities are now being charged a base service cost for wind turbine property. Mr. Speaker, how does the Deputy Premier expect municipalities to bear this cost? Thank you. Deputy Premier. The Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question. The member opposite makes reference to some of the challenges that municipalities and rural communities face as a result of lack of predictable funding. Certainly, uh, this, the, our government recognizes that. It's why we have increased more funding for those communities. In fact, we triple our, our, our funding for infrastructure supports uh, from $100 million to $300 million, Mr. Speaker. And in regards to some of, the, uh, some of the assessments, that is ongoing right now, and we're going to be working closely with them as we proceed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, back to the uh, uh, Deputy Premier. I know they increased the debt, uh, but we did not need to tell us that. Many municipalities were unaware of this added cost. Now municipality speakers' uh, hands seem tied because they can't stop the construction of these approved projects. Many of these municipalities were forced to take these uh, turbines and feel disrespected by this Liberal government. They can't afford this uh, added cost for policing. Mr. Speaker, municipalities that are stuck with the added cost want to know what's this government going to do about it. Thank you. Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, um, this budget goes a long way to provide more support for those municipalities. Unlike the member opposite and his, uh, his government, they actually downloaded and costed more for, for those, uh, those communities. And that download provided a tremendous amount of pressure. Mr. Speaker, what they want is predictable funding. What they need is support. What they need is ensure that we go forward with uh, the programs that we have for infrastructure that is very clear in this budget. And many of the municipalities have come back citing how, uh, how pleased they are by the support that we're giving them in this budget, $116 billion over the next 12 years to support municipalities like the one he's mentioning. We will be there. We'll do what's necessary to facilitate the infrastructure and, ultimately, the revenue that municipality will generate as a result. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. New question, the member from Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Speaker, yesterday in Hamilton, staff and their supporters rallied outside St. Joe's Hospital, where it has been announced that 136 jobs, including 61 RNs, will be cut. We know patients pay the price when frontline staff are cut from hospitals. I've heard from constituents who are hearing from that mental health and addictions programs are being cut, programs that saved lives. It is disgraceful that this government is cutting frontline health care workers when vulnerable people are already being underserviced. Just yesterday, we learned that Hamilton Health Sciences is considering closing a hospital. I've heard from seniors who are languishing on wait lists for access to care, patients who are concerned about how long it's taking to get their kids access to specialized Question. care. This government is failing the basics and the fundamentals. Speaker, when will this minister stop the cuts to health care in you. Hamilton across this province? Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the uh, the budget of 2016, of course, adds an additional a new one billion dollars to the health care budget for a total of almost 52 billion dollars. And, Mr. Speaker, there's one issue specifically that I need to address, and that's her comment about the comments in papers in Hamilton that uh, Hamilton Health Sciences is thinking somehow of closing a hospital. That nothing could be further from the truth, Mr. Speaker. There was a Cons consultation and a public discussion about what health care in Hamilton might look like 10 
or 20 or 30 years down the road, and changes that might be necessary to provide care closer to where people are, close to home, close to where people need those services. So we invest in Hamilton Health Sciences. We invest in that. Uh, the member from Hamilton uh, Mountain. Really? Really? There's a vote in about 60 seconds. The member from uh, Dufferin Caledon on a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. Pursuant to Standing Order 99D, I have not received an answer to my question tabled on November 5th to the Ministry of Children and Youth Services. I ask for your assistance in getting that answer. For the members, uh, can I proceed? <laughs> You've been good today. Um, the table is in the process of, uh, of indicating that, and if that turns out the case, I'll defer to the, the minister for a response for you or the deputy house. The deputy house. Uh, I will acknowledge the, on the same point of order. Mr. Speaker, I'd be uh, glad to look into this matter and uh, have the uh, questions answered expeditiously uh, for the member who has made that request. There we go. So indicated that uh, the table still has to check first to see that if it is due, but if it is, then we've now taken care of that. The member from Stormat Dondesco, St. Clary, on a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. I just want to take this opportunity to uh, welcome uh, a friend and staff member, Marcel LaPierre, from her office, along with his wife, Sue. Son Rick and a friend from Sydney, Australia, Jen Williams. Welcome to Queen's Park. The Attorney General on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, if you would allow me, I would like to introduce the CEO of the Montfort Hospital, Dr. Bernard Ledieu, which is my alma mater. Minister of Tourism, Culture, and Sport. Well, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to introduce my friend and uh, friend of many in the legislature, Mr. Courtney Betty, in the East Gallery today. Thank you. You have a deferred vote on the amendment to the motion for allocation of time on Bill 163, an act to amend the Workplace Safety and Insurance Act 1997 and the Ministry of Labour Act with respect to uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Call on the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
Would all members please take their seats? All members, please take your seats. On March 1st, Mr. Bradley moved government notice of motion number 62. Mr. Yakubuski then moved that the motion be amended as follows, that the second, third, and fourth dispense. bullets dispense. dispense. Dispensed. We are now dealing with Mr. Yakubuski's amendment to the motion. All those in favour, please rise one at a time and, uh, and, and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Urich. Mr. Urich. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hudak. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Madame Mayor. Madame Mayor. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Duga. Mr. Duga. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Naidu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Reneal. Ms. Reneal. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. It should be Song. It should be Song. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Montag. Mr. Montag. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes are 77, the nays are 15. The ayes being 77 and the nays being 15, I declare the amendment carried. Are the, are the members ready to vote on the main motion? Yes. <clears throat> Mr. Bradley has moved government notice of motion number 62. Is it the pleasure of the House the motion carry? Carry. I heard a no. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say nay. nay. In my opinion, the ayes have it. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell. Same vote. Same vote. Seventy-seven. Seventy-seven, and the nays being fifteen, I declare the motion carried. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.